Happy St. Patty's Day! The Fight Nire is here. <laughs> take that! Take that! <laughs> How's it going? Lee Hayward here on this Patty's Day with a live video chat for Friday, March 17th. Hopefully you are doing well, and this is coming through loud and clear. Just going to wait a moment now. Let's see if this is coming through. Let a few people hop onto our live stream. Make sure that it is coming through loud and clear. All right. We got Mr. Dead Fish joining in. Welcome, Mr. Dead Fish. <laughs> is it coming through loud and clear? I'm assuming it is, right? It usually does, but again, I just want to do a little um, audio and video check. Make sure that you can hear me and see me before we get into our video chat today. We have Ruben joining in. Welcome, Ruben. Sounds good from Mexico. Or, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, so, I, I can't even pronounce that. So, saludos. Saludos from Mexico. Uh, we have Bumble's Apple. <laughs> Loud and clear. All right. I love the uh, interesting names. We got Greg joining in. Got your brother. Good stuff. Welcome, Greg. Glad to have you tuning in. Nice, nice, nice. So the way these video chats work, for those of you who are new to these video chats and you're not sure, this is a live Q&A. So it is viewer's choice as far as topics of discussion. So anything that you would like to discuss with regards to fitness and nutrition, building muscle, losing fat, any specific challenges with regards to your workouts, with regards to your eating plan, supplementation, uh, injury prevention, anything along those lines, anything health, fitness, and wellness related, feel free to type those questions and topics of discussion into our chat window there. And we are streaming simultaneously from Facebook as well as YouTube. So wherever you are tuning in from, if you're on Facebook, it's probably the comment section below the video. If you're on YouTube, then there's a chat window to the side of the video. But both uh, platforms will post the comments to me and I'll be able to read them and answer them and we can have our video chat here today and live in real time. So I'll be hanging out here for approximately an hour thereabouts and we'll take it from there. So again, if you have any questions or topics of discussion, feel free to type those into our chat window and we will take it from there. And let me know where you're tuning in from. Let me know what part of the world you're tuning in from. It's always Nice to know, because we do get an international group, right? We always have uh, people, usually like a lot from across North America, but we also get folks from Europe, from, uh, you know, the, throughout the Middle East. We just get some people from Australia and places like that. <sighs> Having a piping hot cup of coffee today and a top dad mug, because I am the top dad, or at least I'm the top dad in this house anyway. <laughs> All right, so let's see who we got joining in. Jose is joining in loud and clear. We got Stevens joining in saying it is loud and clear. That's good stuff. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you for tuning in. I recognize some of these names. Some of them uh, are regulars for sure. Some, um, not totally sure if they're regulars or not. Some are, are newer to me, or at least not as familiar. All right, so let's jump into this. Let's see what we got here. Jay Freely is joining in. Hi, Lee. How do you deal with upper back pain between the shoulder blades? 32 years old, fairly good shape. It's most prominent when waking up in the morning. No issue has been found in MRI or x-rays. That's a challenging one. Upper back pain between the shoulder blades. And obviously you've had, you've had it checked out. So, I mean, this... Just based on that alone, I'll just put the comment back up there again. If you've went and got MRIs and x-rays, this isn't something that just happened a few days ago, right? Like, this has obviously been something you've been dealing with for quite a while. And, you know, it's, it's probably somewhat chronic if you've gotten to the point of getting it checked out with MRIs and x-rays. I'm assuming that. Now, again, I could be wrong, but I'm assuming that would be the case. So... It's it's a really hard for me to know for sure. I mean, like there could be nerve issues, like maybe there's an impinged nerve. It could be postural issues. Like a lot of times when people are dealing with anything upper back related, it could be due to neck or posture or something. Could be nerve impingements. Sometimes um, when you get these unexplained pains, 
especially ones that can kind of linger for a while, it may be related to nerve impingements. And I'll just kind of share a, a story from my own background. A few years back, I had, for, for some reason, it just kind of hit me out of the blue. I was getting this unexplained pain right down through my index finger on my right hand. And it, it just, it came out all of a sudden and I was like, man, what the heck is it? It's just this weird numb pain got shooting through my index finger. And I mean, I, I just I felt like pins and needles and everything else. And then I do suffer from a bit of carpal tunnel syndrome. So first I was thought it was the carpal tunnel acting up, but it felt different. It wasn't the same type of sensation. And it kept lingering on, lingering on. And it went on for like going on for a couple of weeks. And it was hindering me from actually just doing normal stuff. Like I couldn't even grip the same as I normally do, like when working out and things like that. So I finally, you know, went to the doctor and got it checked out. And when I explained it, he said, you know, it sounds like it could be a nerve impingement in your neck. And the way he explained it was like all the nerves of the body run down through the spinal cord, down through the neck. So like all throughout your limbs and your extremities and everywhere else. So he said a lot of times that could be the root cause. So I mean, maybe there is some nerve issues. Like if this is a, a pain and there's nothing showing up when you get it checked out, it could be something to do with nerves. So there is some things that you can do like various neck exercises to help. And these are, are beneficial to do anyway, like just to keep your neck and posture and everything healthy and mobile. Cause a lot of people kind of neglect the neck. They don't do any specific exercises and you get very, very stiff, especially if you're doing a lot of work on the computer, sitting, you know, hunching over sometimes when we get into those subconscious bad habits that can place a lot of stress on the neck and the upper back and everywhere else. So what I'm going to do, Jay Freely, is I'm going to share a video that I made where I went into detail talking about this whole finger pain episode and how I found out it was nerve impingements in the neck and the exercises that I ended up doing to help correct that. And once I started incorporating those exercises, the nerve impingement eased up and the pain eased up as well. So I'm not, again, I'm, I'm not a doctor and I'm not here checking you out in person or anything like that, but it's just... That's where I would start, just based on your comment alone. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just uh, dig that up over on the YouTube channel and post the link into our comment section there below, so you can go check that out. Um, and for those of you who are want to check this out, like maybe for afterwards when the replay is posted up, if you do a search for Lee Hayward unexplained hand and finger pain, nerve impingement. That's the name of the video, unexplained hand and finger pain and slash nerve impingement. But I'm going to uh, grab that video link and post it. It's actually, uh, when did I make that? It was six years ago. It's, it's crazy how time flies. <laughs> but I'll just post it there. Um, and I'm, I'm going to title it as neck exercises for you. Um, for nerve pain. I'll just, you'll know what I mean. And I'll put the link there in our video chat comment section. So hopefully that comes through. Right. But if for some reason it doesn't actually, I think it's only coming through on Facebook. Okay. That's weird. Or no, I think it might've came through on YouTube as well. Okay. So should have came through in the, in the chat window for Facebook and YouTube. I think it did. But if not, just do a search for Lee Hayward. Um, unexplained hand finger pain nerve impingement that's this that's the title of the video and i share my story about that but then i go into the exercises and that's what i'm sharing it with you for i know you don't have hand and finger pain but you know the the neck exercises for relieving nerve impingement that's what i'm sharing it for um do, 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 do. all right let's move on And just to clear it, this is Jay Freely again, following up with that one, saying, I've tried chiropractors and physio, nothing really helped. That's weird. Uh, I've been working out for years. Ibuprofen seems to make it disappear for the day. See, the ibuprofen, you're just, you're, you're band-aiding the pain. Like, you're not fixing the problem. It's just numbing the, the pain sensations. That's what you're doing. So, I mean, it's, it's great for that short-term relief, but it's not fixing whatever the root problem is. And the fact that you tried chiropractors and physio, it's just interesting because 
it may be something that you need to do repeatedly over and over. Like when I was doing these neck exercises I was telling you about, I did them multiple times a day, like throughout the day, because you want to keep working it over and over again. Like most of the time when people go to the chiropractor, they go to the physio, they maybe go in once a week, maybe even once every couple of weeks or something like that. So if maybe it's not frequent enough to get the benefit. When I was doing these exercises, and I, I basically compiled these lists of exercises from from talking to physios and, and chiropractors and, and watching a, a gazillion videos on YouTube of some of the best neck and, uh, and exercises for relieving nerve impingements. And I compiled these exercises that I used, but I did them multiple times a day, like morning, noon, and night, every single day. And then after about three weeks, it eased up. So if you're going to a chiropractor or physio once or twice a week, it's probably not enough frequency to have a lasting impact. So that's my thought on that one, why you may not have gotten much help from the chiropractor and physio. But again, this this is just me speculating. All right. So don't t take everything I say with a grain of salt. I mean, hopefully the, the what I shared can, can give you some benefit. But, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to point you in the right direction here. All right. All right. Let's move on. All right. So I'm rambling on with something I really don't know. <laughs> uh, Joe, Jose is joining in. Hello, Lee. How are you? Last week, you were discussing cold therapy. My gym just put in a cryo chamber. I've been using it a few times. Uh, someone at the gym told me that cryo helps to recover faster by reducing inflammation, but you need, but you need an in inflammation for hypertrophy. What's your opinion on that? Uh, I'm also on week four of the Blast Your Arm program. I get Blast Your Biceps program. That's the alliteration. Blast Your Arms don't sound the same. Blast Your Biceps, even though it is a full arm program. All right, so um, just recap here. Um, What's my opinion on using cold therapy, i.e. The, the cryo chamber, which is just blasting you with cold? I honestly don't think it's going to have a, a negative impact on muscle growth. I, I really, like, if you're training and you're stimulating muscle growth in the gym, cold therapy or whatever you do afterwards is not going to undo that muscle stimulation. Or your muscles still have to recover and grow and everything else. Uh, it, it can help, like I've mentioned last week when we were talking about it, like what I often do if I'm trying to reduce muscle soreness is hot and cold therapy. So alternating the hot and all, then alternating the cold. And how this works is the cold pulls blood to the core, heat flushes blood to the surface, and you can literally circulate blood throughout your muscles without actually doing anything. So it's like active recovery circulation, and I find it's very helpful. So if I have soreness in any area, this hot and cold therapy really works well. Now you can also just do the, the cold therapy alone. And I know a lot of athletes and people have, have done that. I've, I've used it in the past myself, not the you know, the cryo chamber myself, but I've done like cold showers and and um, ice baths in, in nature, like getting out literally out in nature. I posted the video talking to, and sharing how I was you know, went out in the river in, in the middle of winter when snow and ice on the ground. and and burying myself in the snow bank and all that. So a few things like that, but I, I don't think it's going to have a negative impact on your workouts. I mean, it's, it's one of those things, you know, you, you can argue the pros and cons with it, but is it required to make progress in the gym? Heck no. Right. Like people have been building muscle and getting in shape for years without any cold therapy. Uh, can it help the recovery process and is there benefits to it? Yeah, there, there's some research and study showing that this can help and a lot of athletes do like to use it as a tool to boost their immune system and to help aid with recovery. So it, my, my advice is try it. If you like it, continue it. If you don't, then you know it's not going to make or break your, your pro progress in the gym. And so that's, that's my opinion on it. If anything, it could help the recovery process, but it's certainly not going to slow your gains. Uh, what else we got there? Let's see. Frank is joining in. Hello, Frank. This is Frank from Sweden. So I usually listen to these after they're broadcasted. And I guess over in Sweden, it must be very late for you. 
Uh, it says, I'm soon going to be traveling, but wonder if it would be a bad idea to bring my creatine. And that depends where you're traveling to. Um, <laughs> if you are going to another country and you have to go through customs and all that, it's it may have you may have no trouble with it, but if you do get stopped and searched and everything else, you're gonna have to explain it. And personally, when I travel outside the country and I know I have to go through customs and I know I'm going to be checked and searched or whatever. I don't bring supplements with me. I'm not going to bring protein powders or creatines or amino acids or whatever. If I want and need stuff like that, I'll probably buy it when I get to wherever I'm going. If, especially if I'm going to be staying for any length of time. Like if, if I'm going to be there for a while, I'll, I'll buy some supplements that I need while I'm there. But if it's just a short trip, like a week or less or something like that, I'll just do without. Right, it's not a big deal to take a little break from the supplements every now and then. Right, it's not going to make or break your progress because when you get back home, you can resume your routine as normal. Generally speaking, when you travel, your routine is kind of thrown off <laughs> anyway. So throwing off the supplement schedule isn't really going to make or break your progress there either. So that's that's the way I deal with it. And I know people who have traveled recently. I know like the Arnold Classic was not that long ago, and I know some people who traveled to the Arnold, um, and as they crossed the, you know, the, the customs, getting into the United States, right, had their supplements seized, right, their amino acids and their protein powders and whatever else there was, you know, because it just creates, I mean, it's not like it's banned substances or whatever, but, you know, if, depending on the mood and, of the customs officer, right, sometimes they're very picky, so that may just cause them to just want to be a, a shit disturber, for lack of a better word, and seize it on you. So, personally, I wouldn't bother. That's that's my opinion on it. So, again, that was Frank asking if he should travel with his creatine. All right? I wouldn't bother. Uh, have you ever tried Vince Geronda's steak and egg diet? Mm, I've, I've certainly eaten steak and I've certainly eaten eggs, but I can't say I've eaten a whole diet of steak and eggs. No. I've done various low-carb, ketogenic-style diets, which is basically what a steak and egg diet is. It may, by true keto terms, it may be higher in protein than what a true ketogenic diet requires. Because if you start, like a lot of people are very loose with the rules when it comes to, to keto. They usually say, hey, as long as the carbs are low, I'm keto. And that's not necessarily true because true ketogenic diets, you have ridiculously high fat. Like the majority of your calories are coming from fat. Then the next is protein and then carbohydrates are virtually zilch, you know, as low as physically possible. But it's a fat diet. That's what a true ketogenic diet is, is fat. And I'm not a fan of that. I mean, I've, I've tried it in the past. And yeah, I mean, you, you can argue there's some you know, advantages to it in certain situations. I know some people follow it. Some people swear by it and everything else. But my personal opinion, I don't like it. I mean, I find that the, the negatives certainly outweigh the positives from my perspective. One, I don't feel good. Uh, my energy levels are in the toilet. My ability to get a pump and train and build muscle in the gym has gone down the toilet. Uh, speaking of the toilet, I would often, very often get constipated because when you're eating high fat and, and low carbs, you're not getting a lot of fiber, you're not getting a lot of roughage, you're not getting whole grains, you're not getting an abundance of vegetables. So I personally would get bound up, right? I would go from having one to two bowel movements a day, to maybe one to two bowel movements a week when I would go on a, a low carb ketogenic style eating plan. Now, I was actually having a conversation with some of my coaching students in the Muscle After 40 Blueprint, some of the guys who've tried a keto in the past. And they were saying the opposite happens now because when you're eating all that fat, sometimes you get very loose stool. To say. I mean, I know it's a shitty topic to talk about, but hey, it's it's the reality, right? And that's so there's two 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 schools, right? You're either the the bound up, which was me, or the loose poo, you know, the Hershey squirts, which is not a fun thing to do either. And I was actually chatting to a guy the other day, and he was saying that. Uh, when, when he was following the ketogenic diet, he said he couldn't trust a fart, right? <laughs> because it might not be a fart. It might not be air coming out. <laughs> so uh, uh, that's just some of the drawbacks. I'm not a fan of keto, bottom line, right? I like a well-balanced diet. I usually strive to get a third of my calories from protein, a third from carbohydrates, and a third from fat. 
And I find that when you do that, it, you're, you generally feel better. You got higher energy levels. It's more sustainable. And the body just works properly. You're like you don't suffer the ups and downs and the mood swings and the constipation and, or whatever. It's like it, it's, it's like a no freaking brainer, like a, a well-balanced diet. Like we've been hearing that since we were, you know, old enough to know about nutrition. You eat a well-balanced diet. But it makes sense and it freaking works, right? So like don't don't try to don't try to overcomplicate things sometimes. But anyway, back to JE's question. I've never strictly followed Vince Durant's steak and egg diet, but I've certainly done various low carb diets. Uh, we have Denise joining in. Hello, Denise. Denise just just up the road. Welcome. Glad to have you tuning in to the video chat. All right. What else we got there? Philippe is a regular to our chess. Greetings from Chicago. It says, can you explain what are the different types of collagen? One, two, three, four, etc. I suffer from knee arthritis, and I've heard collagen be, can, can be good for the joints. Philippe, I'm going to be totally honest here. I, I would have to look that up myself to understand the different forms of collagen. I'm kind of ignorant when it comes to this. I'm, I've been just collagen. <laughs> I, I haven't been categorizing my collagen as in I have a number one collagen, I have a number two collagen, number three, and number four. So I would have to do my own research on that to figure out the differences, right? So in fact, I'll, I'll be totally transparent. Before your question here, I didn't, I was unaware that there was four different grades of collagen. <laughs> so I was, the one that I use personally is a beef collagen. A beef collagen powder that I get. Uh, I actually buy it from Costco. It's a they got big containers of it. That's that's the one that I've been using myself. I have no idea if it's number one, number two, number three, number four. But I didn't know. <laughs> it just says collagen on the label. It didn't have any numbers to go along with it. So you, you got me stumped. I mean, I'll have to go look that up. Um, but as far as arthritis and then you know collagen helping with it, for full transparency, I've never had arthritis, but I've had joint pain and knock on wood, since I've been supplementing with collagen, I found my joints, aches and pains have significantly reduced. I, I don't have nearly as much joint pain. Now, there could be a couple reasons for that. Um, one, I mean, I've, I've improved my overall eating habits in general, right? Less crap. So, I mean, obviously that's going to go a long way to reducing inflammation. Uh, I've, I've lowered my body weight, right? I mean, I've been under 200 pounds now for, for several years. I always hover right below that 200 pound mark. Like 200 is my threshold. If I ever step on the scale and I see a number two as the first digit looking back at me, I was like, oh, I gotta, I gotta tighten up things. I gotta get my, get myself back on track again. So I always make sure that whenever I step on the scale, there's a number one looking back at me as the first digit. If, if that's the case, then I know, okay, I'm good to go. If I ever see a number two, and I have a couple times, like last year uh, over like, not, not this past Christmas, but the Christmas before, I let myself go over the holidays. And after the Christmas holidays and after New Year's, I stepped on the scale and I seen the number two there. And I was like, oh, <laughs> better tighten things up, buddy. <laughs> right? you're, you're heading in the wrong direction. So it's been, it's been sub 200 ever since. And that's my goal. So that has a big impact on, you know, inflammation, has a big impact on stress on your joints and everything else, just keeping your weight in check. But along with that, I've also been supplementing with collagen, and that has certainly helped. So there's, there's numerous things that I'm doing that could be contributing to reduce joint pain, but the collagen is being done in conjunction with all of it. And again, I haven't split tested it to say, okay, is it the weight loss that's helped with the joints? Is it better diet that's helped with the joints? Is it better diet, weight loss, and the collagen that's helped with the joints? But it's kind of ironic that I'm supplementing with collagen and living a healthier lifestyle and keeping my weight in check and my joints are feeling good and healthy and I'm getting older, which is, you know, which is really good because normally it's the other way around. The older you get, the worse your joints get. But in my case, my joints have been actually improving over the last few years. So I would recommend, I mean, the worst, I mean, the worst case scenario, you're just getting some extra protein in your diet because collagen is basically just protein. It's pure protein is what it is. But it's the amino acids and, and the protein structure is what represents what your body needs for joint cartilage and, and rebuilding those connective tissues. So that's the benefits of collagen. Plus, it's, you know, same as, you know, collagens in our skin and our hair and nails and all this stuff. But it's 
the main thing that we're looking for is uh, in the joints, tendons, and connective tissues. So that's why I use it myself. And I, I recommend it, but um, I'm going to have to go look up the different numbers and see what the heck that means, because <laughs> you got me stumped on that one. Uh, let's see what else we got there. Louis is joining in, or Louis, 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 I'm not sure how you pronounce, but uh, how, how's the weather? Um, it's snowing today a little bit. Not, not a whole lot of snow, but we have had some snow flurries. And it's right around the freezing mark. So it's actually kind of like not cold at all. Not good for fat biking outdoors, I can tell you that. I, I posted up some pictures on Facebook recently of me out fat biking. And the best way and best time to go out fat biking in the snow is when it's nice and cold and the ground is really hard. Now the snow has kind of got that slushy softness to it. it that's no good for, for fat biking. You just sink into it. And speaking of biking, we have a question here from a cyclist. We have Boris. says, Lee, I'm an amateur cyclist. I'm taking a pre-workout powder 30 minutes before my training uh, in the rollers or before going on the road. And I think it helps with focus and strength. Cheers from Ecuador. Absolutely. Uh, any type of caffeine, whether it's from coffee, that's my choice, pre-workout, caffeine pills, caffeine gels, whatever you're, you know, any type of caffeine will certainly help to increase focus. It'll help to increase your energy levels. It also helps to improve fat utilization. So it helps to release fatty acids into the bloodstream to be used for energy. So it's, it's a great... Uh, performance enhancement, and that's why a lot of athletes will use caffeine prior to training, prior to sporting events or whatever. Uh, I do the same thing. The only thing that I'm going to caution on, especially when it comes to pre-workouts, is some of them can be a bit strong, depending on the type of pre-workout, how much caffeine, and what other stimulants and stuff they got thrown in them, because nowadays... The battle for pre-workouts is all, like each one is trying to outdo the other one. Like ha who can jam the most caffeine per serving? Who can jam in the most stimulants per serving? And it's, it's almost like a pissing match to see who can make the strongest pre-workout. And I actually find a lot of them are overkill, meaning they're too strong. So when I use a pre-workout, I usually use like half a serving, like most standard pre-workouts. So the one that I am, um, I, I had one recently, the, and had 300 milligrams of caffeine per serving. And like, that's a lot of caffeine. It is for me anyway. Uh, like when I'm having a cup of coffee, like depending on, on the, the type of coffee, it's probably between 100 to 200 milligrams max, you know, for, for coffee. So that's, that's a good dose of caffeine for me. Uh, but these pre-workouts, the one that I had had 300 milligrams, and I've even seen some of them that have more, that's a lot. So I literally take half a serving and I find like that is plenty. That's more than enough. So it's something you just might want to be aware of. And the way it is with pre-workouts now, I usually only take them when I need them. Like it's, it's not something I want to take day in, day out for every exercise session or every bike ride or whatever. I, I kind of save it for those sessions where I'm really going to push myself and I want to kind of like maximize that one session. So like if I'm doing an FTP test or I'm going to do a really hard workout or, you know, some something that I really want to kind of like, OK, we're going 110 percent today. We're going to we're going to drain the tank and give it our all. That's when I would take the pre-workout. But for just regular day to day workouts or regular day to day bike rides, I, I don't use a pre-workout. I just have a, a cup of black coffee and I find like that's more than enough. It's enough to give me that little mental and physical pick me up without burning out, you know, and and just feel like I'm consuming too much because caffeine is a double-edged sword, right? I mean, it, it does have its benefits, but if you consume too much, uh, it can have its negatives as well. You, know, you can feel jittery, have that ner like nervous energy, uh, and it also hinders your sleep patterns. I mean, places extra stress on the body. So it's a fine line, right? You want to, like, like everything, you, everything in moderation, uh, that certainly applies with caffeine and pre-workouts and things like that. All right, Eric's chiming in about the keto t discussion we were having earlier. He says it's good because it doesn't spike your insulin. And absolutely right, that is true. It doesn't spike insulin. So from a pure fat burning point of view, that is one of the advantages to keto. 
but there are times when we do actually want to spike our insulin, especially if your goal is muscle building and performance training, like prime example, like for people who are doing long distance cycling, like Boris, um, having, you know, carbohydrates and, and, uh, actually spiking your blood sugar is a good thing because that'll keep your energy sustained for longer periods. If you're trying to do a long bike ride on low blood sugar, you're going to bog. <laughs> it's not going to, uh, you're not going to have sustained high energy output. So it's a fine line and it depends on, on the situation, the individual and what it is you're training for. Uh, what else we got there? Frank is saying, thanks for the answer. I need to go to bed. <laughs> yeah, that's Frank's over in Sweden. So good night, Frank, and catch the replay tomorrow. All right, take care. Let's see what else we got. So we have Vince is joining in. When doing a bro split, how many hard sets would you recommend? <laughs> well, let's let's do it this way. Let's just say when working out, how many hard sets? Because, you know. Regardless of the split, if it's a push pull legs, if it's an upper lower, if it's a total body, or if you're doing a bro split where you hit one body part a day, you know, how many hard sets? Again, there's no hard set rule <laughs> to the hard set question, but I can give you some generalizations here and some kind of guidelines to follow. When you're doing any workout, you want to start off with light weights, warm-up sets, just to go through the motions and get your body conditioned to the exercise. Once you've warmed up, then you do your progressively heavier warm-up sets, building up to a heavy set. Now, once you've done your heavy set, like you can probably do a couple heavy sets, depending on your fitness level, depending on what it is you're trying to achieve. I usually will do one to two sometimes three heavy sets and again it depends on, on what i'm trying to achieve and how hard i'm pushing myself but most of the time it's one to two heavy sets and the way I, I judge that is i'll do that first heavy set and i'll say okay how do i feel you know after i did that set if i feel like you know i got a little bit more in the tank i want to push myself a little harder then i'll do an additional heavy set you know if i'm feeling extra energetic you know, just bouncing off the wall with energy or I really want to push myself, you know, I got something specific that I'm training for, then I may do a third heavy set. But beyond that, if, if you're pushing those sets to momentary muscular failure, going beyond that is kind of like diminishing returns. So the most I would do for an exercise is three hard sets of, of, a, of a specific exercise. If you're doing more than that, then you're having to hold back the intensity. Like, for example, if you're doing like a, a five by five, or 10 by 10 or some of these prolonged uh, workouts. I mean, they're still hard sets, don't get me wrong, but like, you're not going to be able to rep out five, like a, a five by five program and, and do five sets to failure and maintain that, uh, that intensity for all five sets. Because right? if they're truly sets to failure, your fatigue is going to set in and okay, you might get five reps on the first one. You might struggle to get four on the next one, struggle to get three on the third one, and then accept, and, you know, it's just your strength is going to dwindle as you as you fatigue. So usually I, I do two hard sets is, is normal, right? If I'm really pushing it, it'll be three. And um, I should also define what is a hard set, right? A hard set is training to momentary muscular failure. Now we should also define what momentary muscular failure is. Failure is the point at which you cannot do another repetition with good form. It's the point where your form breaks down. It's not the point at which you can't move the weight at all. So this is a, a good distinction we should make because a lot of people think failure is the point where the, the weight ain't moving, right? I'm stapled to the bench press with a barbell across my chest screaming for help. I've hit failure. Yeah, you, you've hit failure and you went beyond, right? Failure is the point where your form breaks down. So before you got to the point where you were stapled to the bench press with the barbells pinned to your chest, you were probably struggling. You know, maybe one side was lifting a little harder than the other. Maybe you were arching your back and lifting your ass off the bench. Like all these things, your form is starting to break down. Once your form breaks down, you've actually hit failure. Like that's my definition of failure. So as soon as I get to the point where my form is breaking down, I rack the weight and end the set. All right, same thing if I'm doing squats, right? Like as soon as my form starts to break down, I start to struggle or, you know, my I'm, I'm leaning forward or it's, it's not a good smooth repetition, I rack the weight. Uh, with a deadlift, I mean, if you start to hitch and it's, it's not coming up smooth and your form is breaking down, end the set. 
with bicep curls, this is the big one, right? If you start to heave and swing and have to use momentum in order to complete, you've hit failure. So as soon as your form starts to break down, and that's when I end the set. And then if you want to do more beyond that, well then, hey, do another set. Rather than training beyond failure and, and risking injury, because as soon as you start training beyond failure where your form is breaking down, now you're into no man's land because you're lifting heavy weight, max effort, shitty form. It's just an injury waiting to happen. Yeah, I mean, you are placing a lot of stress on the muscles. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it is maximum muscle stimulation, but it's also maximum risk of injury stimulation. So there's that fine line, and it's it's not worth it. I would rather end the set, and then if you still want to do more beyond that, then, hey, add in an extra set. That's what the way I go about it. So I, you won't see me in the gym, like, doing forced reps and, and cheating and, you know, crap like that. I, I try to keep my form relatively strict and as soon as it starts to break down that's when i end the set so hopefully that answers vince's question about how many hard sets uh let's see what else we got eric's talking about i think we're back to the keto discussion again there saying uh short term is good but it's not sustainable for a lifetime and i totally agree there is advantages in a short term if someone wants to do a low carb fat loss program for a temporary like a bodybuilder trying to peak for competition, an actor trying to get ripped for a movie role, a fitness model doing a photo shoot, something where like, hey, I'm going to put on the blinders, you know, I'm going to go pedal to the metal for the short term and get the job done. And then I'm going to go back to something more sustainable afterwards. I mean, you can certainly use it that way. The problem with that is if you can't sustain a fat loss diet over the long term, the results are only temporary. And most people especially average people who are trying to lose weight and get in shape and improve their health, they're not doing it for the short term. <laughs> like if, if you're 300 pounds and you're overweight and your goal is to be a lean and healthy 200 pounds, you don't want to be a lean and healthy 200 pounds for a couple of weeks and then balloon back up to 300 again. <laughs> right? You want to maintain a lean, healthy 200 pounds or, or whatever your number is. I'm just plucking numbers from here. So going on a short-term diet to try and achieve a long-term result ain't going to work. Right, you have to change the lifestyle approach, and that's a totally different, uh, a totally different game entirely. All right, moving on, we have Tad the Lad. <laughs> yeah, where do you where do you come up with these usernames? I don't know. And Tad's from the Newcastle, England. Ah, right, welcome. It's late over in the UK, so I'll try to address your question in a timely manner. Says I'm lactose intolerant when it comes to protein shakes or whey protein. Is that a question or what? I don't know. I'm lactose intolerant when it comes to protein shakes or whey protein. And that's it. <laughs> All right. Um, well, it sucks that you're lactose intolerant, um, but there are options around that you can get non-dairy protein sources or protein sources that have the lactose removed generally whey isolates have most of the lactose removed so even for people who are lactose intolerant you may be able to get away with a good quality whey isolate and not only that a lot of them actually put in the enzymes to help your body break down and digest lactose, the lactase enzymes, you know, because if you're lactose intolerant, chances are you're using the lactase digestive enzymes to help break down lactose into simple sugar so your body can utilize it. A lot of the higher quality protein powders, especially the way isolates, have those digestive enzymes as part of the, the, the protein powder itself. So you may be able to use some protein powders, but the lower end ones, like the concentrates or the blends, and a lot of the cheaper proteins, it's just going to rot your gut. <laughs> if you, I mean, eat, I even notice that myself, and I'm not lactose intolerant, but if I use a cheap protein powder, and I've, sometimes I've been guilty of this before, especially if I'm traveling, and I just say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm traveling for a week, and I didn't bring my protein powder. As I mentioned earlier, I don't travel with powders in my suitcase, especially if I'm going across the border. So when I get to wherever I'm going, and I'm sometimes I'll buy a protein powder, and this happened to me a couple years ago, back when um, – we were traveling to, uh, we we're in Florida. We we're tra traveling there, and I bought a, just a whatever the, the store brand of, of protein powder at, uh, I'm not sure if it was Target or the grocery store, where, wherever it was, but it was just some 
some brand I never heard of, but it was, hey, okay, it was like a two-pound container of protein powder. It was, wasn't that expensive. I said, ah, that's good enough. I'll get that. And, man, I tried to drink it, and I was bloated and farting and gassy. And it's just like, man, this just – it doesn't mix well. It doesn't feel good, and it's, it's just rotten my gut. So I can only imagine how much crap and filler and, you know, lactose and gunk was in that versus the, the good quality protein that I normally have. So, yeah, when it comes to protein powders – you you get what you pay for a lot of times, so I don't I don't skimp on them. I would rather invest in a good quality protein powder, you know, one that's uh, an isolate base because that's going to have a lot of the the crap that you don't need and just the pure protein that you want. All right, moving on. We got Jeremy joining in. Says I've been watching you since 2012. Oh, I appreciate the support, Jeremy. It's, 2012 to me doesn't seem that long ago. I, I don't know. I mean, it's just. Like, because I'm thinking some of the videos that I've posted back then, and, and I mean, it, it doesn't seem that long ago, but heck, I mean, that's over a decade ago now. Uh, I mean, I've been doing this, I started YouTube back in 2006 when YouTube started, and of course started my website back in 1997. So, I don't know, it just, it doesn't, it's crazy, like, it's, it's like a blink of an eye. It doesn't feel as long as it's been, <laughs> but... Again, that is quite the long time for sure. So, again, appreciate the support and glad you're still following along. Obviously, you must be getting some value or you wouldn't be here. All right, moving on. What else we got there? We got Ryan is joining in. He says, I tried fat biking today, and I agree. Too soft and slushy. On that note, would you recommend Zwift for those in-between seasons of for cycling when the weather isn't cooperating? Yep, I am a big fan of Zwift. I I, I got my uh, my gravel bike set up on the indoor trainer on a smart trainer, and I, I use Zwift multiple times a week. Like if if I can't get out for a real bike ride, I'm doing a virtual ride on Zwift. Now, obviously, you're not getting the bike handling skills because you're you're sitting still on a trainer. But as far as the intensity and the effort and the fitness, that's all there. And, and I really like Zwift because it makes it feel more realistic. Like when you're, for those of you who have no idea what the heck Zwift is, Zwift is like a virtual game where you're riding a bike. Think of like a racing game, like, you know, car racing or whatever. But you're, it's, it's everybody's on bikes and people from all over the world. So every other rider that you see on Zwift is an actual person riding and you're the engine. So how much effort you put into the, the smart trainer is how fast you go in the, in the game, right? So it's, it's a real virtual racing game and you can do group rides or races and all that. So it's awesome. And the thing I like about it is it feels very real. So when you climb a hill in Zwift, it feels like you're climbing a hill, like your smart trainer will adjust, it'll increase the intensity, and it'll feel like you're going up a hill. So, I mean, I'll be down on my indoor trainer, up out of the saddle, like grinding it out at low cadence, doing a steep climb, and then once you, you know, crest the climb, then you can spin at a high cadence, just like you're coasting downhill. So it, it has that realistic feel, and the, the way the smart trainer does is it adjusts according to the game. So it's, it's brilliant how they got it set up, and, and I love it, so I, I use it a lot. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I've got m many, many hours racked up on Zwift and that's what I do to kind of build my fitness when the weather is not good. And I mean, I, I'll use it all year round. Like if, if the weather is, is crap outside or sometimes if you're too busy to, to justify a, a solid bike ride outside, then I'll do an indoor session. Yeah. All right. Moving on. Uh, if, if you, Ryan, if you do sign up for Zwift. Friend me up because Zwift is just like a whole social media thing as well. So you can search for me and uh, friend me up or follow me or whatever they call it over there. But uh, yeah, if you do have a Zwift account, reach out to me. Let me know. Maybe we can go for a virtual ride. <laughs> uh, Neil's joining and Neil's a regular to our video chats. Always joins in in the in the wee hours of the, or the early morning over in his neck of the world. He says, good morning. I saw your winter biking pics with your wife. What's your take on getting seven to eight hours of sleep as an adult for muscle growth and health? It's pretty hard nowadays to do to work and stress. I hear you. I'll, I'll be totally honest and transparent. I struggle to get eight hours of sleep. I would love to get eight hours of sleep, but 
Most nights I don't. Seven is a good night. Six is a uh, mm, okay. I can function on six. Right, I can get by on six hours of sleep. Not not great. I would prefer seven, but I I'm not suffering if I get six. Less than that is like eh, energy's in the toilet. I want to make up for it with getting a nap the next day or something. So sleep is is important, right? You definitely want to maximize sleep the best you can. But does it have to be eight? That depends. It depends on you. you you'll you'll kind of learn this by listening to your body and how you function and how you operate. Like I just just by me sharing my own personal insights, I know if if I got eight hours of sleep, I would probably feel overslept. I'd be like, what the heck? I mean, <laughs> I slept in if, if if I if I got eight hours of sleep. Seven is a good night's sleep for me. Six is okay, right? I'm not hurting. I can get by and do do a, a, do my workouts and still have energy to burn with six hours of sleep. Less than six, I'm suffering. I, I mean, I can I just know that because I I've gone through it. So that's my personal guideline. I want a minimum of six and ideally seven plus. So that's where I shoot for. So my I say six to seven is my sweet spot, if you will. Uh, and if I'm getting more than that, then that's gravy. That's bonus. That's bonus sleep, right? You know, put an overcharge into the batteries. So you got to really look at it from your own point of view and see where you function the best in terms of your, not just your exercise performance and your strength and all that, but in terms of your mental clarity and your cognitive function. Because if you're sleep deprived, you usually kind of like, you're like zombie mode and your brain's not functioning properly. So that's what I would recommend personally. And of course, the more sleep you get, the better it's going to help when it comes to your muscle growth as well, because sleep is huge for recovery. It's also huge for fat burning, right? Sleep is a, a lot of fat gets burned when you sleep. If you, this is a common thing, you see people who are sleep deprived, uh, they usually struggling with their weight as well, because if you're, if you're not sleeping, you're probably up eating. And in the nighttime, it's it's so easy to just start grabbing these crap snacks. Like that's when the potato chips and that's when the the candy and the chocolates and the, you know, the just the the picky food, right? The, you know, the, the cookies and the crisps and all that kind of stuff. That's That kind of crap gets eaten in the wee hours of the morning and late at night and stuff like that. Whereas throughout the day is when most people eat real food. You know, they're going to sit down to the table with a meat and potatoes and vegetable type of meal. But in the nighttime, that's when the crap food comes out. Again, it's the, the chips and the crisps and the snacks and, and all that stuff. So if you're not sleeping, chances are you're probably up eating crap. <laughs> and that's, that's just the reality. So that's going to have an impact on your fat, for sure, body fat. Uh, and, of course, muscle growth, uh, growth hormone gets released during deep sleep. So if, if you're not getting that deep sleep, you're not getting the optimal growth hormone release, and you're also not getting optimal muscle recovery as well. So you definitely don't want to shortchange the sleep. If you are struggling with that, I mean, obviously you can look into various sleep, natural sleep solutions to try and improve it. And there's a gazillion videos and, and resources online for you know some generic tips and suggestions on how to improve your, your quality of sleep. Uh, but if needed, you can even discuss it with your doctor and see if there's any, you know, sleep aids that you can use to help with that but this is something if you're struggling with it get it get it figured out right don't don't just keep putting it off and ignoring it and thinking oh i'm okay i don't need sleep blah blah, blah. i'll sleep when i'm dead and all that crap that you hear people say no <laughs> if if that's your line i'll sleep when i'm dead then you're, you're just going to be dead quicker because <laughs> sleep is important to the quality of your life right we need our sleep all right, moving on. Let's see what else we got there. We have Joseph joining in. Any special advice on working out slash nutrition for new dads? Will be a first time dad in late June. Also, should my newborn son start out with a full body workout, upper lower split? All right. Well, first off, congratulations. Right. That's that's exciting. Right. And it's 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 an exciting and scary adventure all in one because your life is going to change like that. Right? As soon as the baby comes home, uh, you know, as soon as the baby is born, <laughs> you know, it's it's I mean, it's changing now. Right. I mean, obviously, you, you got a pregnant wife and all this and you're dealing with getting things ready, but as soon as the baby gets here, it's just going to be instant change. So I, I can appreciate where you're coming from. And unfortunately, 
for a while, you and your needs and your priorities and everything else are going to be, you're going to go like second class citizen, bottom of the barrel. Your priorities don't matter. And the baby and mama and everything else is going to be to take care of them. So yeah, your fitness is going to suffer, but you can try to make the best of it. And I'm speaking from experience here because I, <laughs> I didn't realize the dad bod thing until I got a dad bod. Like it's a real thing, right? <laughs> you see new parents, new dads. It's a real thing because before my son Harvey was born, like I thought I was busy before, you know, <laughs> before I became a dad. After I became a dad, I was like, man, I was wasting so much freaking time that I didn't even realize it. You know, like, especially when you got a newborn, like everything has to be planned out to the letter. You know, you just can't pick up and go. Like everything has to be planned out. Like a trip to the grocery store is a big freaking ordeal. <laughs> right? It's not just jump in the car and go. No. I mean, you got to get diaper bags and you got to get bottles and you got to get this and that and change the clothes and blah, blah, blah. And you got to get the car seat. And you look, it's, it's a big ordeal. Like everything's a big ordeal. So everything in life is going to take so much more time and your priorities and your schedule is going to be jam packed. So finding me time is going to be a challenge. One thing that I did that was a game changer and really helped mini workouts at home. And I actually wrote a blog post on about this. If you go to my blog, leehayward.com, it's probably still up there on the front page. Let me just do a quick search and see. But this was a game changer for me is mini. Yeah, it's actually right there. It's it's if you just go to leehayward.com, it's there's a blog post says no time to exercise, start with 10 minutes. So I'll let her just post that in our uh comment section there so you can go check that out. Uh, mini workouts blog post. All right, I'll just post it there so you can go check that out. That Read that blog post because that was a game changer for me and that's how I got myself back in shape again is giving myself permission to do mini workouts and, and I'll give you a, a quick overview of what I mean by mini workouts. It's those little blocks of time that we have throughout the day where we don't think we can do anything but something's better than nothing and you got to think like we're, we're filling our day with something all the time anyway like think of scrolling social media on your phone or flicking on the television and just watching something or going on youtube and watching a video or, like there's all these little things that we do that it's it's so insignificant and it'll take a few minutes and you don't even think nothing of it. Like if, if, heck, if you're watching this video, we've been here for 50 minutes now. All right, so this is this is time. Like you could have been watching this while doing cardio. Like if you had a cardio machine, like a stationary bike or a treadmill, you could have had your your phone or your computer set up or stream it on the the smart TV or whatever. You could have been watching this while doing cardio. That's one of the things that I I do personally. Like if I'm going to watch a YouTube video, very often I will do it while doing cardio. If I'm going to listen to a podcast or I'm going to do something like that, very often I do it while I'm doing cardio. So I'm kind of killing two birds with one stone. Instead of just sitting on my ass, I'm actually moving my ass, getting some exercise. So that's one way. But another thing is, is these little blocks of time. Like, let's just say, you know, you, you got 10 minutes right before something. Maybe you got 10 minutes before you got to leave to go somewhere or 10 minutes here or 10 minutes on your lunch break. These little mini blocks. You could squeeze in some exercise. Maybe it's like on your lunch break. It's instead of sitting in the break room, scrolling through your phone on social media, you get outside and you go for a little 10 minute walk around the block. Uh, maybe when you're home and you're, you know, you got a few minutes to kill, maybe you could do some push ups and body weight squats. If you got some dumbbells or resistance bands, you could do some exercise, like some dumbbell curls and, and rows and shoulder presses or whatever. Even if you're only doing a couple sets, a couple sets is better than nothing. And then just think of, if you did that frequently, like maybe you did a couple mini workouts throughout the day, where it's like mini walks, you know, little 10 minute walks around the block, a uh, little body weight circuit of push ups and body weight squats, maybe some dumbbell curls at home, and you did that a few times throughout the day, that adds up. Like in and of itself, it's not going to make or break anything. But if you think of like over the long term, all those little mini workouts will add up to something significant and versus doing nothing at all. Because I this was my trap and that I was so stuck into is I thought, well, if I don't have an hour to go to the gym, I don't have time to work out. If I don't got, you know, 
half hour, 45 minutes to do cardio. I don't have time to do cardio. So I was always looking for that big hour block of time. And then, of course, if you're factoring in an hour at the gym, well, you also got to factor in getting ready and driving to the gym and doing the workout and then changing and out of your gym clothes and then driving back home. So basically, if I didn't have two hours, I didn't have time to go to the gym and I didn't have time to work out. And two hours as a new parent is a big freaking chunk of time. But there's lots of times throughout the day where you may have 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, something like that. Well, you might not be able to get to the gym and do a workout in that length of time, but you could do something at home. You know, you could do some push-ups, you could do some squats, you could do some ab work, you could do some stretching, you know, you can do some resistance band work or some dumbbell work, or if you got a home gym, great, you can do something there. But little blocks of time and giving yourself permission to do these mini workouts throughout the day. That was a game changer for me. And once I got out of that bubble of thinking I need two hours or I don't have time to work out and thinking like, hey, I got 10 minutes, I can do something, right? I can bang out some push-ups, I can bang out some squats, I can whatever. I can get outside and walk around the block. Doing that was a game changer. And that's what allowed me to get back into the whole fitness routine again and break out of my dad bod rut where I was just getting fatter and fatter and like knowing that I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And the problem with, with when you let yourself go physically and you start like going, Oh, I, I didn't work out this week. And then you it, like the longer you put it off, the harder it is to get started again. So like I'd go a few days without working out and I was like, Oh, screw it. I'll start again on Monday. And then Monday would roll around and I get busy and something else would come up I'm like, ah, I'll start again next Monday. And then you go a couple weeks without working out. It's so easy to get caught in that rut of not working out. And then before you know it, a month goes by, two months goes by, and like, shit, I haven't worked out in two months or, or longer. And then you look like a bag of crap. And then when, you, when you're not exercising, guess what happens to your eating? Your eating goes down the toilet because it's like, well, I'm not exercising. What's the point of eating good? I'm not. <laughs> and then, so it's just like this negative spiral, right? It's just you're going downhill and going downhill fast. Whereas if you can reverse that spiral, and even if it's a small positive, hey, I'm going to do a little mini workout. Well, that little mini workout is the spark. And then once you do that little mini workout, it's, it kind of like triggers you to think, you know what? I'm going to make a better food choice for my next meal, right? And it's just that the complete opposite. Now you start taking these little mini actions, which can then spiral into an upward spiral. So we're all, you always got to be consciously aware of it because we're not staying the same. We're either moving forward or we're falling behind. And then once the momentum starts to build, you can either move forward faster or you can fall behind faster. So you want to always keep that spark moving forward. So these mini workouts and that blog post that I shared with you, take that to heart. And again, if, if you need some more help with this or you want to strategize, feel free to reach out to me. Like this is stuff that we go into detail with in the Muscle After 40 Blueprint program. Because all the guys in the Muscle After 40 program, I mean, they're working professionals, they're busy parents. Like they got a lot of shit on their plate. <laughs> you know, there's a... It's, it's not just, hey, I got all the time in the world to work out. It's like, no, they're time crunched. And they're like, how do I prioritize my own health and fitness and still get everything else done as well? So this is something that we really strategize a lot within the whole Muscle After 40 Blueprint program. So if, if you want to chat about that, feel free to reach out to me and, and we can discuss it. All right, let me move on. But hopefully that was helpful. And the reason I spent some extra time on that one is because that's that's a topic that I am passionate about because I've been through it. I've been through the ups and downs, and I know I know <laughs> what you're about to embark on. All right, we have Atlas Plaza, or I think it is, ND. All right. Do you have any new thoughts about your cycle bulking program? Just bought the program, and on the first week of the cuts, i.e. low calorie depletion phase. I'm 135 and my goal right now is to reach 160. You're you're just starting it. Literally trust the process. The, for those of you who are unaware of it, this, the cycle bulking diet is a program that I put out several years ago. Um, the first launch of this program was actually back in 2011. Myself and my friend Vince Del Monte, we launched the program together and it was called the 21 Day Fast Mass Building Program. Now, that was very popular back in 2011. Uh, back then, it was actually went to the top of the, the ClickBank muscle building list in terms of sales for a while. I mean, it was a, it was a big uh, 
a big deal in 2011 when we launched. It was one of the top muscle building programs on the, on the ClickBank marketplace. And we sold literally thousands of copies of that program. And I relaunched it a few years ago as the cycle bulking program because the cycle bulking diet, I should say, because that I'll just share the story. Like that program was initially my idea. And my friend Vince, like he's really good with, with internet marketing. In fact, he has his own business now helping people with internet marketing. So anyone that's interested in internet marketing, especially if you're in the fitness space, search for Vince Del Monte, he can certainly help you there. Uh, but we launched that program together. So it was basically my core program. And then he put in some stuff and, and helped with the marketing side of things. But he did add in some of his own elements to the program as well. But it wasn't true to the original program if that makes sense. Like it was come some variations to the workouts and some variations to it. And I mean, it still worked. Don't get me wrong, but it was, it wasn't true to the core of the whole cycle bulking diet program. So what I did is I re edited it myself and went through it and like, okay, this is the, this is the real deal. This is the way it worked for me. Cause this is something that I utilized myself back in my early bodybuilding days when I was trying to, you know, add mass and, and, and work my way up through the, through the bodybuilding competitions and stuff. So this was something that I utilized and that cycle bulking diet that you have now, that's the original tried and true proven system. So trust the process and, and just follow it through. And it's going to take a few cycles through to really appreciate how your body responds and to see the results. But for the first one, just, just follow the program exactly as it's outlined. And then based on your feedback, you can adjust it as needed for the next cycle through. And in the program, I even, there's sections there on how to adjust the program based on the feedback you get from the first cycle through. So before you go adjusting the cycle bulking diet, the program, the calories, the macros or whatever, you got to go through the first phase of the program, go through the first phase of it first, and then see how your body responds. And then based on the results, then you can make adjustments for the next phase. And uh, the program even outlines, like, if this happens, do this. If that happens, do that. <laughs> like, it, it lays it out step by step how to make those adjustments as you go through it. And for anybody who is looking to fill out the frame with lean muscular body weight, I'll actually share the link in our chat window. Just give me a second here. It's uh, cyclebulkdiet.com. I think that's a cool check. It's actually been a while since most of the people that I work with now, like my coaching students, they're middle-aged guys, like muscle after 40, 40 plus, and very few of them, there are, there are some, but very few want to gain weight. Like if you look at the average middle-aged man out there these days, he ain't skinny. You're not counting his ribs. You're counting his belly rolls. <laughs> All right. So most of the people that I deal with these days that I coach personally are on the opposite side. They want to lose weight, not gain weight. But if anybody wants to fill out their frame with lean muscular body weight, if you are on that slender side, this is a good program. So I just put the link there. It's the cyclebulkdiet.com. You can go check that out. All right, moving on. I'm going to get ready to clue it up soon. So we've, we've, we've already crossed the hour threshold, but I'm going to answer a few more questions because we do have some more questions coming through. Uh, Eric saying, I'd rather stick to real food if possible rather than using protein shakes. Protein shakes are just a meal supplement. I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I, I, I use both. I mean, in fact, I consider protein powder or protein. I, I, let me rephrase that. Protein powder as just another source of, of protein. You know, meat, chicken, fish, protein powder. It's, it's just another source of protein. I rarely drink shakes anymore. I usually um, use my protein powder with food. So like this morning, for example, I had a bowl of high protein oatmeal. So I made up a bowl of oatmeal and then I mixed in a scoop of protein powder with it to make high protein oatmeal. Sometimes I'll make blender smoothies and add in protein powder and frozen berries and stuff like that and mix it up nice and thick. So I'm eating it's like a high protein ice cream. Um, other ones, sometimes we'll make high protein pancakes. So I'm usually using protein with my food. I'm, I'm very rarely do I just drink a scoop of protein in a, in a cup of water and shake it up and drink it. Like I'm, I'm very rarely drink a shake anymore. I'm usually using it with food. So high protein oatmeal, high protein blender, smoothie, ice cream, uh, high protein pancakes. Those are my three go-tos. 
usually. Uh, another one that I do, I put a scoop of protein powder in with Greek yogurt, mix it up with high protein pudding. That's that's really nice, especially if you're looking for a, a high protein late night snack, kind of satisfy the sweet tooth craving, make it feel like you're cheating and eating like pudding. You know, put chocolate, a scoop of chocolate protein powder in with a cup of fat free plain Greek yogurt, stir it up. It's just like chocolate pudding, right? I mean, it, it takes on the taste of the, the protein powder. So it feels like you're you're cheating, but you're not. But it's a really nice way to bump up your protein and satisfy that sweet tooth craving. Satisfy those late night cravings. All right, who else we got joining in? Dan is joining us. Welcome, Dan. Uh, this is, we can target muscles with protein, but does it have any bearing on the muscles related tendons? If not, is there anything that does? We can target muscles with protein, but does it have any bearing on the muscles related tendons? I'm not sure what you mean by targeting muscles with protein. Uh, I mean, when you consume protein, I mean, it is going to get broken down and utilized for whatever tissue repair needs the protein. Like the protein is going to get digested, broken down. It's going to go into the amino acid pool in the body, and the body will utilize those amino acids as it needs. So if you're recovering from a workout and the muscles need the amino acids, and they'll take priority. If something else needs the amino acids, it'll take priority. But I can't say like, Hey, I want to put this protein into my quads and I want to put that protein into my delts. I mean, I'm not sure if that's what you mean by targeting muscles with protein. But um, anyway, you're asking there, does it have any bearing on muscles related tendons? All our body tissues, our tendons, our ligaments, our hair, our skin, our nails, everything is made of protein. Like everything contains protein. So when you consume protein, it's not just skeletal muscle, everything is is made of protein like your internal organs you know your your everything your 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 eyes your skin your nails your hair your tendons your ligaments everything is, is made with protein protein is found in all living tissues so yeah it's, it's certainly helping all everything not just your uh, muscle tissue it's it's helping all bodily tissue i think that's what you mean <laughs> it, if not a Feel free to, to email me and we can clarify it if, if that's if I'm not answering the question properly. And for that matter, anybody who's watching this right now, if, if you have any other questions or, or maybe I misinterpreted your question and I answered it not to your satisfaction, feel free to reach out to me. Send me an email and we can chat offline. Or technically it's still offline, but off YouTube. <laughs> uh, what else we got there? Um, let's see. Um, man, baby boomer fitness joining in. If I hit, so if hit training burns more calories than standard issue cardio, does my back, buys, and shoulder workout this morning of 39 sets go on burning calories for many hours too? It's hard to accept. I only burn five to 600 calories with a one hour intense workout like this. Thoughts? That's really challenging to know for sure, but I will say this. I mean, I, you do have, there is such a thing as an afterburn effect, right? Like you, you will burn more calories after your workout is completed. It's not just the calories you burn during the session, but in the recovery process. And how much you're burning afterwards really depends on, there's a lot of variables. Like how much stress was applied to your body? What's your current fitness level? Because for someone who is, fitter and has higher recovery abilities, your, your body is operating at a higher level of, of fitness and a higher level of efficiency, you're going to, like, what could, what would have been a workout that would probably destroy a novice might be just, you know, a, an active recovery session for someone who's more advanced, you know, so they could probably go through that workout and not even have any soreness the next day and feel fine, whereas someone who's at a lower level of fitness could go through that same workout and feel destroyed <laughs> for, for, for several days afterwards. So if you have that delayed onset muscle soreness and you just feel like you've been hit by a truck for, for days after your workout and you, your body is still burning calories and, and, and rebuilding itself during that time. So 
it, it's hard to pinpoint it. And, and you'll hear a lot of people say, oh, the afterburn is huge. And then some people say the afterburn is insignificant and then everything in between. I, I really think it depends on the individual and their fitness level and how much stress that was to your body itself. So, but bottom line, if you're exercising, you're working out, you're burning calories, right? Like the simple as that. And now, depending on whether you want to gain weight or lose weight, that's going to determine like how, how you adjust your caloric intake based around that. You know, if, if you're gaining weight, then you're in a calorie surplus. If you're maintaining weight, you're in a calorie maintenance. If you're losing weight, you're in a calorie deficit. Regardless of what the calorie macro count or what my fitness pal says, or regardless of what you think you're eating, you can't escape the real world results, right? Like, I was having a conversation with one of my coaching students recently and he's like, Oh, I'm only eating 1500 calories a day and blah, blah, blah. And I'm not losing weight. I think, well, if, if maybe if, if first off, you could be inaccurately calculating your calories, which is very likely because the truth is nobody can accurately calculate calories because even food labels are not accurate. I've discussed this in past video chats. Like, the standard food label is off by 20%. That that's that's just that's that's standard common knowledge in the fitness in or in the in the food industry. The FDA allows for a 20% margin of error on food labels. And more often than not, food companies are probably going to err on the low calorie side because they know people who actually read nutrition labels are looking for the lowest calorie numbers. So if, if something says it's hundred calories per serving, it's probably 120. You know, and that's what's legally allowed. I mean, they could be outside the legal limits and just not caught yet, right? Because the the food police haven't haven't arrested them for you know, for exceeding the calorie uh, the calorie limit restrictions, if you will. Anyway, that that's uh, another topic. But most people who are tracking calories are, are not accurate with it. Like, uh, there's been studies done on this where they've had you know people tracking their calories and then they actually seen okay. What do you think you're eating? How much are you actually eating? And, and it's, it's very common for people to be off by 50%. So regardless of what your numbers are, if you're not losing weight, you're not in a calorie deficit. If you're not gaining weight, you're not in a calorie surplus. So depending on what it is you're trying to achieve, right? You, you have to adjust based on real world results and not just based on what the numbers say and what you think it should be. I don't know if that's, I might have went off base with that question but you were asking about calories burned during workouts and <laughs> but bottom line you're burning calories during your workouts how much the afterburn is going to be is going to depend on your own fitness and recovery abilities but bottom line you're still burning calories regardless all right i'm going to get ready and clue it up soon but let me see what else we got there um we have bodybuilding tim from Sweden, I'm a new fan. Welcome to the chat. Always nice to have new people joining in. Much appreciated. And hopefully you're getting some value. It says, I've sometimes eaten a bit of ice cream and potato chips after dinner, early before bed, after work, and I think it causes me to wake up in the night. Is it true? I could. It could possibly be. I mean, it's, it's hard to say <laughs> for sure, but, you know, Junk food like that can spike your blood sugar and then kind of disrupt things, especially if you're eating it late at night. So it's possible. It may be, or there could be other things causing that. I mean, it could be stress, things on your mind, whatever. I mean, it's it's, it's very hard to pinpoint why someone is, is, is waking up in the nighttime unless it's a if, – if you notice that – when you eat your ice cream and potato chips and you also wake up in the night and it's like, it's kind of like the correlation. Like, Hey, if I don't eat the ice cream and I don't eat the potato chips, I sleep well throughout the night. But when I do eat it, then I'm waking up. Yeah. I'd probably kind of link those two together. But if it's more, sometimes it happens, sometimes it don't, then it, it may be not necessarily related. Not saying that I'm recommending eating potato chips and ice cream before going to bed, but you know, it, it may or may not be impacting your sleep. Put it this way, I don't think it's helping. <laughs> Certainly not helping the waistline, that's for sure. But, but yeah, that that's something. This is, I, I'm just going to touch on this topic for a minute, because some people find when they go to bed on an empty stomach, they sleep better. Others find if they have food in their system, they sleep better. I'm kind of more in the line of if I have a bedtime snack, I sleep better. And I usually try to have 
healthy food options. So like that one that I mentioned earlier, the protein powder mixed in with some Greek yogurt, that's very often a, a common late night snack for me. I'll have that. And I find it's, it's giving me some protein. It's just giving me something, something in the belly to, you know, satisfy my hunger. And I find that I sleep better when I have a little bit of food in my belly. Sometimes I'll add some, some fat to it. Like I might put the the protein powder, the Greek yogurt, and a spoonful of peanut butter. So I mean, I'm getting some protein and some fat in there. So it's a bit more satiating, a bit more filling. Uh, and I find like that helps me to just take the edge off my hunger so that I can sleep. Because I find it, if I don't, if I go to bed on an empty stomach, I usually wake up in the middle of the night, my belly's growling and I'm hungry. And then I want to go raid the fridge or something in the wee hours of the morning. So I, I have those tendencies if I go to bed on an empty stomach. So to prevent that from happening, I'll have a bedtime snack, usually, you know, some protein before I go to bed. And I find that that allows me then to comfortably sleep throughout the night without waking up feeling hungry. So that's something I've learned through trial and error on my own that works for me. You kind of have to learn what works for you. So it's, I'm not saying that it's right, wrong, good or bad, because we all have our own individual preferences and tendencies here. Right? Like if you find you sleep better on an empty stomach, hey, go to bed on an empty stomach. If you find you sleep better with food in your belly, then hey, try to find a way to have some food in your belly that's healthy food that's going to be conducive to your health and fitness goals. But again, getting back to your question there, if you find ice cream and potato chips before bed cause you to wake up, then maybe not eat ice cream and potato chips before bed. That's <laughs> right? that is not something that would be a must-have on any uh, bodybuilding meal plan anyway. But again, thanks for joining in, Tim. Glad to have uh, glad to have you joining our video chats. Hopefully, we'll be talking again soon. What else we got there? Jeremy uh, says thanks again for all you do. Uh, thanks again for all that you do. Question mark. I still remember the first video that I watched from. It was your calf video. In your experience, how has YouTube changed since you first started? Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> this, this 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 could be the question we end the video chat on. This could this could take us home, there, Jeremy. Um, YouTube has grown massive. Like when I first started YouTube, I thought it was just a place to literally upload a video. That was it. It was just it was just like a place where you could post a video. Because back then, video files were huge. You couldn't just email somebody a video or anything like that. Like it was, it was a big deal to, to send a video to somebody. So when YouTube came along, how I first started using YouTube wasn't creating content or any of this stuff. It was just like if I had a little clip that I wanted to share, oh well, I can upload it to YouTube and then I can send somebody the link. Because what I used to try to do back in the day is I say, okay, I'll try to upload this video to an email and internet was so slow and the video file was so big it's just like it's not going through so i had videos that i wanted to share with friends or family or whatever that i couldn't share because there was no way to share it so when youtube came along I said, hey i can share videos that's the way i looked at it nothing more and what i was doing is i was recording my workouts at the time because this is back when youtube was getting started i was you know interested in powerlifting and training for powerlifting so how I started recording myself, recording workouts, was was getting ready for powerlifting. I'd bring in my eight millimeter camcorder, eight millimeter tapes, you know, in, in the camcorder, set it up on a tripod in front of the power rack, and I would videotape myself doing a squat and see if I was making depth. Or I'd videotape myself doing bench presses and see if I was holding the pause at the chest long enough for it to count in competition. You know, and that's what I was doing. I was just videotaping my lifts to see if this would be good enough to pass in competition. Because you learn so much from yourself when you see it in the third person perspective versus what you see looking in the mirror. All right. So that's why I was doing it. And that was a suggestion from other power lifters and, and people that I was talking to. It was a suggestion, hey, video videotape yourself and use it for self coaching. So that's what I did. And whenever I hit a personal best, like I remember first time I bench pressed 400 pounds, right? I mean, it was a massive milestone. Like, holy shit, I benched 400 pounds. Well, that went up on YouTube. But it wasn't like some proper video. It was just like, here's a clip. Here's me bench pressing 400 pounds, nothing else. And then I just shared it with some of my buddies. Like, hey, I benched 400 pounds and here's proof, right? There it is. <laughs> and 
that that's how it got started. And then eventually you see people started actually posting up proper videos. You know, they were talking and doing stuff in their videos and it was very crude. Almost like you sometimes see like these little clippets, like people doing like social media stories and these little like just raw off the cuff videos, like no editing or anything like that. That's what YouTube was for the longest while. Like a lot of stupid videos, stupid cat videos and stuff like that. Right. And now it's evolved where a YouTube channel these days is almost like having your own TV network in some cases. Like there's companies out there that are spending millions of dollars to create these professional productions on YouTube. And I mean, I'm sure you know, you probably subscribe and watch some videos from companies like that, right? It's not some little rinky dink crap thing like it was at the start. It's now it's become this massive empire. And a lot of companies have, it's just like a full blown TV network, you know, to have a YouTube channel. And I'm sometimes like as, as a YouTuber myself, because I know I'm not at that level, I'm almost intimidated to make videos because I'm like, man, the quality of what I'm going to put out is nowhere near, you know, this cinem <laughs> cinematic experience that some of these bigger channels are going to be putting out. So I, I honestly, like that's kind of like a self-limiting doubt or belief or whatever that I have because I'm sometimes thinking like, Man, I, I, there's videos and content that I'd want to put out, but I know it's not going to be nearly as good as some of what these other channels are putting out. So I was actually chatting to some friends of mine, and basically I just got to get over it and just start putting out some more content again because I've kind of gotten away from it, other than these live video chats, which I love doing because just interact and chat. But putting out more workout content and more, you know, the the old Ask Lee Q&A and just general, you know, nutrition cooking videos and stuff like that. Because even though it's not professional, people still like it because it's raw and it's real. So I, I kind of have to get out of that bubble where I think that like, I got to be producing some, you know, TV channel quality video and just think, hey, I just put up the same stuff that I built my channel with for years. Like there's over a thousand videos on my channel and most of them are just little quickie videos shot with a handheld camera. I mean, back in the day, they were all shot with, you know, uh, eight millimeter camcorder cameras not digital cameras i mean it was tape <laughs> right and and i had this converter hooked up to my computer where i could take take the video off the tape and convert it into a digital format on the computer and then upload it i mean it was all kinds of crazy crap that we had to do it wasn't like nowadays where everything's digital but that's how i did it back in the day i mean a lot of my videos were shot on eight millimeter tapes in a, in a camcorder and then converted to digital format and nowadays, it's so much easier because everyone got a freaking smartphone with a camera that's a hundred times better than the, you know, the, the camcorder cameras that we used to buy. But yeah, it's it's evolved a lot, man. Uh, so uh, anyway, that's that's my opinion on the change of YouTube. I mean, I could go on and on about it, but that's that's the the down and dirty version of it. So hopefully, you found that helpful. And uh, thanks for sharing. Thanks for asking. I much appreciate it. All right, guys, I'm going to get ready and clue this up. I think that's pretty much, well, there are a couple other questions there, but we've gone well past our hour, as we always do, right? <laughs> well, so we got a new, we have uh, uh, du Duarte, I think it is. I could be mispronouncing your name. I'm sure I'm butchering it, but we have Duarte Martins, new subscriber from Portugal. Welcome. Glad to have you joining in to our video chat. That's awesome. I always love to have new people joining the the Total Fitness Bodybuilding family. Uh, what else we got there? There's a bunch of other questions coming through, but guys, we're kind of like out of time. So I'm going to get ready and clue this up. But if there's anything that you would like to discuss, you know, if I didn't get to your question or you want some more elaboration, feel free to reach out to me. And I have my contact information in the video description below. So if you're watching this through uh, YouTube, just pop open the video description and message me or email me. My email address is down there. If you're watching through Facebook, send me a private message. That's the easiest way to get in touch with me. And if we're not already friends over on Facebook, friend me up. Right? Just do a search for Lee Hayward and friend me up over on Facebook. And if you do send me a friend request, also just send me a, a private message saying, hey, I follow your YouTube videos. Please accept my friend request or something like that. Just so I know you know, context of, of who's friend requesting me. Because I, I do sometimes get a lot of friend requests from, you know, as everybody does on social media, you get the, the spam bots and the crap and 
people trying to sell cryptocurrency and all this kind of shit and all, you know. So I don't accept every friend request, but if you send me a friend request and then send me a message saying, hey, I follow your YouTube videos, then yeah, by all means, I'll accept your friend request and we can chat through Facebook. Anyway, guys, I'm going to clue it off. Hopefully you enjoy the video chat and we'll be back here again next week. Same time, same place. Have yourself a good one. Take care. Over and out. And the break.